soup come up first or there's alphabet soup stuff. Welcome to Stan the Energy Man this week. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And we're here today to talk to a gentleman who's uh, actually just got into town from the West Coast with some, uh, some great ideas and great thoughts on maybe how we can help our electric, electrification of our transportation grid and get more charging stations out there for electric vehicles and maybe even get some charging stations out there for hydrogen vehicles, which of course we know that's my favorite. So we'll be talking to a gentleman named Toby, Toby Kincaid from uh, Oregon, and uh, he's going to tell us all about what he's got in store for the rest of the world. Toby, welcome to a the show. Great Thanks pleasure. for being here. Thank you so much. So let, let the audience know kind of how you got into doing what you're doing, because you haven't been doing it for a couple of weeks. You've been doing it for a long time. No, as long as I've been breathing, it seems. But okay. uh, Well, when I was a little kid, I remember the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and it was disturbing as a little kid, it, all of this violence and so forth. But at that time, my brothers helped me build a little mini bike, and in a field nearby, I could run in the mud, and I had a 35 cent allowance for my chores, so I could fill my tank for 25 cents, 10 cents for candy, happy kid. The oil embargo hit, so it's 1972. Suddenly, I couldn't fill my tank. I was like, hey, this is a serious matter. Energy really matters. Yeah. So that, with the kind of war going on, really kind of made me very introspective, as you know, probably any kid is at that time. I remember walking to school, it's about seventh grade, and it's cold Oregon morning and freezing, and I'm like, well, how do you do it? How are you going to power this world? And at that moment, the clouds parted just slightly, and the sun went bing, and I went, oh, yeah, <laughs> the sun. It powers the natural world. Why not the industrial? I was great. Hooked. That's actually, <laughs> that's actually a really great analogy because... You know, here we are burning fossil fuels to make electricity in Hawaii in particular. Yes. And uh, in reality, we have buckets of sunshine falling down on us all the time. Oh, I think it's the best kept industrial secret. You know, not all gold is buried. That's right. You know, one square mile of sunlight, you know, what's that worth in a year? Well, at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, do the math, it comes out about $130 million a year. Mm -hmm. So if I went to someone who had a square mile and said, you know, I'm going to mine $130 million a year of, of gold out of your land, you might say, well, I can tell you, there's no gold on that land. And I would have to say, you know, not all gold is buried. That's true. So it's a tremendous resource, and it's worth an amazing amount of money and a value because we can use it directly. Mm -hmm. So you have the epiphany by the sun hitting you in the forehead. <laughs> but, but how did you get from, you know, being a kid and going, I really care about this stuff and I care about energy to doing what you're doing now? Well, I, when I got into school, in the college, I, I wanted to study physics and minored in history. And I, I went through a few years, got to my senior year, and uh, did a, a, a couple of conferences. I had a solar-powered laser satellite I oh, called neat. SolSat. And the, it was uh, from the, the literature, a little yellow dye you could pump with the certain wavelengths of light. And in a, in a laser, you get this tremendous output. Mm. So I went around the country trying to get some support for this. And Martin Marietta liked it. And they go, well, that's interesting. Where did you do your doctorate? And I'm like, uh, well, actually, uh, I'm a sophomore. <laughs> They're like, OK, go back to school, get your master's, and you know, get your doctorate, and then come work for us. And I thought, you know, I, I'm not sure if, if that's the right path for me. Okay. So at that moment, when I should have kept continuing to graduate, I thought, no, I'm going to start my own company. So okay. I, I started SolarDyne at that time. And how long ago was that? Oh, that was uh, in the mid-80s. Okay. So it goes way, way back at that point. Okay. And then uh, once I started to form the company, I thought, well, I'm going to work on the technology. And so I thought, well, solar energy is optical. Mm -hmm. Why not use optical systems to concentrate it? Use the sunlight as a raw material mm -hmm. and then optically process it and see if you can get a better result. And I'd run all around and, and, and try and get some support for this, but it was a little controversial because photovoltaics was going more for a thin film and they were going for exotic materials. And, and the electrical engineers I met just maybe were not trained so much in optics. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, it wasn't very popular. So I kept with it and kept on it. And, and built a, what I called the Mariposa, which was this uh, kind of linear concentrators and boosted mm -hmm. the output about three times. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting. But it was when I, I kind of went to uh, move to Cambridge in Massachusetts that I thought, okay, 
I'm going to figure out what's the ideal fuel. And so I, I went to the MIT library, the big yeah, Barker Engineering yeah. Library, wonderful library. And I started, uh, I thought, what I'm going to do is list all of the fuels, methane, propane, butane, ethanol, kerosene, gasoline, everything, and list all of the exothermic energy you could get and yeah. all of the different characteristics. And so I was finally ready after a month of typing this into Lotus 1, 2, 3. I thought, here we go. You know, that dates me a little bit. <laughs> High speed guy. So I was ready. I'm going to say, all right, now, what's the best fuel? So I thought, well, the best fuel would have to be powerful. So let's sort everything in terms of the exothermic energy and combustion and from, from least to most and hit sort. Boom, top hydrogen. Hmm. I went, oh, that's interesting. Hydrogen. And I thought, hmm, well, that's why they use it in the space shuttle, in the external tank. I thought, oh, hey, that's interesting. Next question, what would be an ideal fuel? Well, it would have to be clean. So list all of the combustion products from toxic to least, hit sort. Top hydrogen. of the list, hydrogen. <laughs> Oh, hydrogen, okay. Oh, clean, I get it. When you burn hydrogen, you get hydrogen Water. oxide, which is H2O. And I thought, well, that's pretty clean. So I thought, that's interesting. We got two hits on that, you know. Two for two. Two I'm for two. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, what's the next thing? Well, it has to be available. So I thought, okay, I've listed all of the Most available, available feedstocks. Yep, yeah, hit sort. <laughs> Ding. Three for three. Hydrogen. Yeah. And I went, okay, wait a second. This, you, know, you make it from water, yeah. and the water is everywhere, you know, it covers the planet, you know, we're mostly made of it. So it was just tremendous, and it was at that moment I thought, okay, there is no debate about what is the best fuel. Everyone was saying, should we do this, should we do this? No, 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 no. If physics matters, the answer is very clear. Mm -hmm. It's water-based hydrogen. Did you do another sort that said um, by weight? Well, I, I, at that point, I, I, I didn't get to that point. I thought, there it is, because those were the three big ones. And of course, you can add many, many more. Uh, but it's, it's just an incredible uh, amount of power mm -hmm. in, in this material. The simplest material in the universe is really yeah. the, one of the most incredibly useful. So yeah. uh, for me, it was like, oh my goodness. That's an epiphany. Yeah. So I, I wanted to go forward with that. Yeah, when we were talking the other day, I, I told you that I had some visitors, and one of them asked me a question about the, the amount of energy in hydrogen compared to other batteries. They were talking batteries ah, primarily. Yes. And so I went back into one of my references and I looked and, and it broke it down by amp hours per kilogram. Mm. And when you look at amp hours per kilogram, lead acid batteries were 55. Mm. And there were a bunch of them in there in the hundreds and 500s and 600s. And ah. then you got to um, hydrazine fuel cell was like 2000 and something. Mm. Hydrogen was 26,000 amp hours per kilogram. So, I mean, when you start, it, was, it blew every other energy storage source away. Absolutely. You know, and that's your weight component. That's your weight to energy component. So, it would even work well in airplanes. We just oh, started Oh, absolutely. Well yeah. That. And it's, it, your point is wonderful. It's not a little better. It's completely better. Yeah. And, and that makes it, I think, a, a, a done deal. So now you see why I'm such a hydrogen fan. <laughs> I do. Because <laughs> keep, people keep asking me questions. When I find the answers, I'm even more impressed with hydrogen. Oh, and you've had the same experience. Absolutely. And, and it's amazing that the, the world doesn't seem to want to yet embrace it, but we have to kind of push the movement. Now, the battery, as you know, is, is really an important thing. It's the key to renewables. It's the key to everything we're doing with the grid work and with uh, EVs and so forth. And when we look at the physics of a battery, there's all kinds of batteries. Mm -hmm. There's gravimetric batteries, there's, there's mechanical batteries, there's inertial batteries, there's cryogenic batteries, there's magnetic batteries, and of course, there's chemical batteries. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's looking for what's the best, you know, anode, cathode, and electrode. And it was Michael Faraday who actually invented those terms because he was doing all this stoichiometric work. And, uh, that's really going to be the key to it, is, is this tremendous uh, uh, power that you can do. So when Faraday was working in his lab in 1839 and with Grove, who on his deathbed said actually it was Faraday who invented the fuel cell. <laughs> A lot of people say it was Grove, but actually it was Faraday. <laughs> He's the master. Um, it was, it's an amazing history that at that moment they begin to realize, people in the world who were still concerned with fossil fuel back then, because they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. Germany didn't have any oil, for example. So when they did electrolysis and, and discovered hydrogen through that means, what did they call it in German? What do we call this? They said Wasserstoff. 
water, water stuff. stuff. <laughs> Hey, not very creative, but certainly descript. Yeah. So we've had this knowledge for a long time. And as we've gone through history, um, the great French inventor, Machaut, who did these beautiful concentrators, he was very excited about hydrogen. And he would use his concentrators in, at, in 1872. They didn't have solar cells. So he took Seebeck's little thermal pile, concentrated sunlight on it, and made current and voltage and then electrolyzed water. And here's this guy in 1872 in France making rocket fuel from water and sunlight. And, and we think we're high tech. And we think we're high tech. <laughs> well, before we get too enamored with hydrogen, which is oh, easy to do <laughs> Very much, yeah. You got me going now. <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about what you've actually developed here. So you, you've, you've developed some um, smaller scale, um, solar based, uh, charging units, both uh, electric for quick charging cars and hydrogen fuel cell, or excuse me, hydrogen electrolyzers for charging up hydrogen vehicles. Exactly. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, how, especially how somebody from Oregon, where I don't think there's so much sunlight as here. That's why we love I've, it. I've been there before. <laughs> yeah. um, how you ended up coming up with that um, that formula, and and give us a description or talk about how how your system works. Certainly. Uh, now, when we do fast charge, it's all about voltage. Mm -hmm. If you have, you just plug into a single uh, line. It's 120 volts. You go up to 220. That's more of a faster charge. We generally call it a quick charge or level two, but it's fast charge when you get to 440 and 480 volts. Okay. So, the big issue now with EV is normally people plug it into the grid. And that's fine. In Oregon, that's very easy to do. We have a substantial grid. But here in Hawaii, you have an island. You have a small area, very remote, very difficult to get these fuels. So when I was working in Oregon, as it applies to here, I realized that even though we don't have a lot of sunlight, it is so valuable we can put that sunlight to work. Mm -hmm. So we've been working on the battery issues. And normally, when we do fast charge stations, I work with a, a great engineering firm, EV4. Uh, the chief designer, chief engineer, Hans Vandermeer. He's excellent. And he designed these beautiful structures that we see that can hold these canopies. And he's been working on DC to DC fast charge using lithium ion batteries. Okay. But here's the thing about lithium. You know, there are many chemistries, but if we look at the energy density of lithium, if you hold a, a kilogram, 2.2 pounds, how much energy can we really store? Well, about a quarter of one kilowatt hour. Now you take two pounds of hydrogen and we can get over 30 kilowatt hours. So there's 120 times difference. Mm -hmm. Now, as everyone moves into lithium ion, of course we have all the smartphones and laptops, but maybe it's not so simple to say, hey, to power the grid, we just need more of those. So that's what really pushed towards the hydrogen. So now what we can do, instead of, of creating hydrogen from natural gas or plugging into the grid and taking that and creating kind of a, a, a lot of stress on the grid. The idea here is a standalone solar platform about the size of a house system, but it all comes down into a fast rapid charge. And the idea is let's put the charger where people go, which is the parking lot. Okay. So you charge where you park. And that's the concept we're, we're developing. Okay, and, and how many kilowatts is that um, PV array? Right, we use uh, four kilowatts. Okay. So during the day, one little station, if you only had that small size, we have different flavors right, right, that right. go up and up. But if you did that, we can create a, a, a small amount of hydrogen that we use as the storage battery. Okay. So we're kind of using a water battery. Mm -hmm. And what that really comes from is, you know, Back in the 1800s, what, or let's say the 1700s, what was the big engine technology? Well, a steam, steam engine, engine, right? Yeah. And that's an external combustion engine. Okay, in the next century, the, the 19th century, what was the big technology? Well, an internal combustion engine. Yeah. And then in the 20th century, I would say it's the jet engine yeah, because of those lovely, yeah. uh, lovely turbines. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, but all of those are still heat engines. Mm -hmm. So what's going to be the breakthrough in the 21st century? And so that led me to developing the notion of a water battery, but it's really an electron engine. So we're going to convert variable electron inputs, solar, wind, or pedaling a bike, but it's variable. But if you got lemons, we're going to make lemonade. So we take that, we start with water, we, we use electrolyzer, the water will break the, the electrolyzer will break it into gases, the oxygen we vent, the hydrogen we store. Then on the other side, we have a fuel cell stack, 
so that when the hydrogen goes in and you blow the air into it, you get most of the energy and the water will come back into that central tank. Mm -hmm. So we've got this kind of water cycle where we've had a lot of work with electrolyzers and a lot of work mm -hmm. with fuel cells. We've been trying to put it down into one little package so that you have a, a wonderful battery that you never need to replace, so it'll last for decades, and uh, you get a tremendous potency. Mm -hmm. So the idea in the charging station is just to put them into the parking lots. I mean, I really feel parking lots are going to save the world. Sure. We, we have like 13,000 square miles of parking lot. Mm -hmm. So if we can put these fast chargers on site, whether they connect to the grid is optional. It, you could connect them to the grid and then take renewable at night and run that electrolyzer. Or not do it and just place them where, as you pointed out, there's grids have issues when you have a mismatch between right, production right, and demand. Right. So this would allow us to kind of plug and play and very quickly put these all around the island, and that would alleviate that kind of range anxiety, uh, range anxiety yeah. that people have. Okay, well we're gonna take a quick break here, and we'll come back in 60 seconds to talk more with Toby about uh, what he's got going in the parking lot. Okay, so I'm Crystal. If you haven't tuned into Quilt okay. Talk before, so you better seconds. do it because you're so missing out on all the information. So we talk about ask, sex, like we talk about religion, many, we talk uh, about how, everything and nothing. So we've got two gentlemen here going to validate how, that, how, right? How Greg Kinkley and Roy yeah, Chu. What What's we've been looking at is uh, uh, the importance of talking the about The fuel cell stacks are variable. I think we're between 90 and 280, and then we step that up, stepping it up. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually pump it to more volts. Absolutely, we just use a DC DC converter. And then we Amen. go to 440. Right. Yeah. Ten seconds. <laughs> what more could I say than that? That's Something in Yiddish. I think. Cheers, <laughs> 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 Oi, vai! <laughs> Come, listen to Quack Talk on Tuesday mornings. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man, talking to Toby Kincaid from all the way from Oregon. Um, and he's all excited, and I'm all excited because we're talking hydrogen, and you can't get me more excited than talking to somebody about hydrogen. I'm just sorry. So, anyway, Toby, we were talking a little bit about. Um, you got a four kilowatt PV array on top of a single structure right and you've got a hydrogen electrolyzer down there breaking apart water and making hydrogen and letting the oxygen go right. and then you got a fuel cell that turns that back into power and you can actually bump that power up to those high voltages you talked about for a good quick charge exactly so so that's kind of the whole in a nutshell how your system works now here in Hawaii hmm. we've got some f challenges with fast chargers because we have a lot of infrastructure that's old. Yes. And a lot of people that are wanna buy electric vehicles, but like the condominium where they live only has two charging stations, mm. or they don't have any, and the association doesn't wanna pay for a new transformer in the building, and you know that would only give them two more stations, or you know, and, and then they, and they wanna spread that cost with everybody that lives there. That's not popular if you had 100 tenants and only 15 of them have cars. But everybody else is paying for their charging stations. Right. So sounds like your your kind of technology would fit really well, um, especially when we get a majority of our people working during the daytime, yes. and they're in parking lots during the daytime. And I'm just doing the math here. Right. You know, if they're in parking lots and your system's designed for parking lots, and we can get employers to say, hey, I'll I'll incentivize my employees to go clean by putting these stations in and they can charge at work. Does that make sense? Absolutely, you? great point. Okay. And that's really goes to the economics. You know, normally we think of cars as the kind of the second largest investment, but they're parked 95% of the time. So as you point out, why not charge where you're actually gonna park the car anyway? And so with this kind of pre-engineered system, we can drop it in without touching the grid so that we don't have that demand charge or even overburden on the transformers. So this would allow, as you said, for the employer and the parking lot owner to kind of monetize or incentivize people using EV cars in their, in their workforce or hopefully their guests. So when, if you uh, want to go to a restaurant or a shopping mall or something, wouldn't it be nice if they said, hey, come to our mall and you get uh, a discount or free charging? And that's, and that's very nice. And also the fast charge is, is, is quick. It, it, it can do an eight hour charge in about 15 minutes. Wow. And that really allows people to just uh, not uh, modify their behavior or have to deviate to even go to a gas station. Mm -hmm. And similar to what you do in your microgrids is you actually replace all of the infrastructure of mining, welding, piping, you know, yeah. uh, transporting, railroading, refining again. So the whole notion of using liquid fuels from thousands of miles away becomes obsolete. 
you've replaced it with the hardware and the gear that you have right on site where it's needed. Mm -hmm. And that goes to that distributed model, which goes to your point that you could put them in everywhere where people would go and make it easy for the owners of the property to actually finance this because they won't, we will. And then we'll allow them some monetization, uh, a, a small charge or something to help capitalize it. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do, you know, the, the cost of something depends on how you pay for it. Mm -hmm. So instead of having the burden up front to, for the property owners to buy these, either upgrading, as you point out, the, the transformers, or even where you put the, the trenching to take mm -hmm. it from the grid, if you're relieved of that, you can just drop them in mm -hmm. like you plant trees. Yeah, and, and a lot, and a lot of um, you know property owners, they don't want to become fuel salesmen either. Right. So you know, you put the system in, you manage it, you run it, then you know they they get uh, payback on uh, on you know on their side a little bit, and you cover the capital costs and and get payback on there. And exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit. Uh, I'm thinking about how much hydrogen you can actually make in a in a day with a four kilowatt. Yeah, not array. very much. So yeah. let me let me say yeah. there's a big sister here. Okay. And the big sister goes up to 50 kilowatts of solar. Now we can put that in several arrays and then bring them into one base okay. that is the electrolyzer and the fuel cell. In the 50 kilowatt version, we can produce about six kilograms per day, mm -hmm. and that equates to about four to five hundred miles of vehicle range. Now, if you have many of these stations, even though one station can't fill up many, many cars, you can have so many available that actually it's convenient to just, mm -hmm. we'll have a, a green light and a yellow light and a red light, and the green light says, hey, come get it, mm -hmm. and the yellow light says, we'll give you a partial charge. But when you have uh, uh, dozens or many of these stations, the actual amount of electricity that, or vehicle miles that mm -hmm. we can create is enormous. Well, could you also maybe put more storage and deliver hydrogen from a central location? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we would work hand in glove with that. And I should say that we may create six kilograms per station, but we'll have a storage capacity of say 20 kilograms. Mm -hmm. So if someone didn't use that station that particular day, no worries, it'll be building up for right. the next one. And then when, we, when the Mirais and the beautiful hydrogen cars really penetrate the market, then you just add a, a dispenser to make it a hydrogen station. See, here you got us talking about hydrogen again. Oh, sorry. I started well, talking well, about battery cars. <laughs> That's right. Well, they're, they're together. I you know, know. They, they complement, but I, I just love the hydrogen I, I so agree. much. <laughs> and, well, what, what makes it neat is you're using the hydrogen uh, electrolyzer and fuel cell as your energy storage and energy production Precisely. instead of the grid. Right. And that, and that allows you not only to take care of hydrogen vehicles, but a, plug-in electric vehicles as well. Exactly. They complement each other. Right. And in reality, that's what my office tries to do mm. with everyone, is make them understand that transportation is going electric. Yes. And electric doesn't just mean plug-in vehicles, it means hydrogen fuel cell vehicles as well. And they do complement each other. Right. And your system actually shows that well because you're using the hydrogen to produce the electricity uh, when you need it. So even yes. if you're making the hydrogen in the daytime, you can charge at night using the, uh, the, the fuel cell to put the power Absolutely. back Absolutely. And if we're grid connected, we can take renewable energy from night and run those electrolyzers and, and further increase the output. Right. So the, this infrastructure that you're talking about, the only way we could really get the numbers to work economically was actually to combine three separate industries into one piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. So we combine primary power production right there on site, the fast charge for the transportation network or hydrogen vehicle with the right dispenser. And then I'm actually integrating as well the communication network so we can run hotspots. Mm. The whole thing coordinated by a smartphone app. There you go. So it's really this integration of mm. all these formerly different areas. Now in the 21st century, yeah. we have all these incredible technologies. It's really almost as much as packaging it and putting it into a, a universal platform. I just see cars with their smartphones chasing for the one station that's available. <laughs> well, now there's a bit of that problem because they're checking, you know, is, is it available? There's not yeah. too many charging stations, but you're right. It's gonna, we might even monetize that part of it, <laughs> but they could bid. Okay, no. why don't you tell us a little bit about where folks can get your books here? And oh, then, then I want you. to leave a few seconds left for you to read your poems. So. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, Fast Charge, this is kind of the story of, of uh, EV4 and these lov lovely structures and so forth. And that's available on Amazon.com. And then this other book is The Water Battery, where we kind of go through the history of energy and empire 
you know, the ancient Greeks uh, defoliated the, uh, ancient Greece, and even Plato wrote poems about how only the skeletons remain of the land. He was his dear Attica, you know, only the bees can survive. So the, this idea of deforestation and energy crisis has been over and over again through through the civilizations. Through civilizations. All right. Okay. Well, this one's for you, Dave Rolf. Wherever you are, <laughs> I've got a poet now that can give you some competition. So <laughs> hit it, Toby Kincaid, with your, uh, your poem. Well, you know, truth is like poetry. Nobody wants to hear it. But in this case, I'll, I'll do I that. I'm going to have you. <laughs> and this is kind of called how we roll. How do we move ourselves? With axle and wheel. We power our engines with unbridled zeal. We pierce the dear earth for rock oils and coal. We run off with ancient sunlight, drilling like there isn't a toll. And burn what we find, no care for results, just spew it all out like a snake when it molts. We burn oils after siphoning off with no care to effluent. At emissions we scoff, no matter that only a few have the holes, no matter what cost or tragic loss of souls. To control holes in the ground is reward vast enough. So what is this protest to all of this stuff? Yes, the mercury will kill all the fish, but it wasn't your first choice. Wasn't beef your best dish? For centuries now, we've turned to combustion to power our cylinders with vigor and gumption. We've lowered the world to what have you got? No matter the consequences, just set off your shot. But a funny thing happened on the way to our glory. We used up the place, and that's been our story. We siphoned the earth with wells like great straws, sucking it dry with ever deeper draws, that tomorrow doesn't matter. Let's use it this way. Let's use it all up to our last breathing day. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not looking to blame. I'm not independent of this sad, toxic game. For I am a prisoner held to this bank. To get to work every day, I need a full tank. So what are my choices? Do I continue to burn and justify my selfishness with each of us in turn? Blinded by the interests who sell you a fish and say, you'll never learn, no matter your wish. Well, this is no good. Burning rocks to survive we will burn ourselves out till nothing's left alive. We're building a time bomb of overwhelming toxicity. And told all the while, just hold your complicity. Well, the world's in trouble as we continue free fall. The reality is terrible and can barely forestall that industry tells you what a beautiful suit. Forget all your woes. Well, from an energy perspective, the emperor has no clothes. So do what is needed. Do what must come. Do what is obvious and use the great sun. Decompose water into elements it comes from. Hold the dear hydrogen and vent the oxygen some. And when you need energy, upon your desire or command, Bring these gases together as fast as you can. Recombined in a fuel cell, great power is found. You get the electricity and the water back sound. So use an electrolyzer and a fuel cell stack. You get most of the energy and the water comes back. <laughs> Thanks so much. I, know, I, I love, to be I love the poem and that was awesome. And so Dave Rolf, eat your heart out wherever you are. <laughs> because uh, now you've got some competition in Hawaii with uh, Toby Kincaid. So thanks, Toby, for being here and uh, being you. on our show today and sharing a great poem and some great books and uh, a good discussion on hydrogen and plug-in solutions for the state of Hawaii, which I think are actually really viable, and I hope we start seeing more of them out there. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Okay. So thanks for being us here with us at Stan Energy Man, and uh, we'll have to have Toby back again, I think. We'll give him a couple weeks off and bring him back to to talk more about hydrogen and transportation. So until next week, Standard Energy Man signing off. Nice job. Thanks, Thanks sir. Oh, I hope I didn't meander too much. I tried to answer your questions. I found myself yeah. kind of drifting a little bit. That was oh, answer his question, Toby. <laughs> that didn't work out well. Did you like the poll? Yeah, oh, cool. <laughs> thank you. Let's see. Oh, I'm going to give this back to you. <laughs> He's the one with the red tile. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, that was fun, and you're right, that went fast. Right? It just flies by. No, no, I, I, I'm astounded. You warned me, Sam. You said, no, look, this is going to go quick. Don't, yeah. don't worry about it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's going to take, I don't know if I...